Okay, Professor, are you ready? Okay, we have uh, 10 hours AM and we may start our lecture. Professor, Professor, did you hear me? No. Oh. I try to write the message to Professor. Okay, Professor, did you hear me? Yeah, I'm ready. Oh, yeah. We may start. Uh, yeah. I try to announce our today's selection. All right. Good morning, uh, our friends. Good morning, my students. Good morning, colleagues, professors, and other people who are uh, today with us. And today we will start the second lecture of our visit professor uh, from Italy, from University of Cataneo, Professor Deepak Rajpa. And today's uh, lecture uh, will be about sustainable business management concepts and practices. And as usually, professor will have a, a, a class about one hour, one hour and ten minutes. And uh, after that, you may ask uh, the questions to professor. You may ask him uh, in video, or you may send a question in our chat. And uh, in this case, I will. Uh, say uh, this question to the professors and the professor will try to uh, uh, explain uh, us some questions that you will uh, ask to us. Okay, professor, are you ready? Yes. Hello, good morning. Yes, the floor is yours. Please start. Well, uh, I'm going to share some of the ideas that I learned uh, by studying the other scholars who have been working on transition to sustainability in business organizations. Since uh, some time, uh, sustainability has become not only popular in the common discourse, but also it has become somehow a strategic need for many companies because they realize that with the current level of resource consumption, with the current level of emissions, pollution, it is not possible to continue uh, business management. So somehow the business organizations are, are trying in their way to to make a transition from current practice to more sustainable, more ecologically efficient um, practices. So now some of these are been studied, and there's a lot of there's already quite a good number of books and reports are available about this. There are already some organizations who are busy in this, and I have mentioned them in my in my seminar note. I have already given you some basic information about that. Uh, you may find that in the bibliographical references that I have provided with the original uh, seminar note. Now here what I'm going to do is just to share with you what I learned from the others and what I learned by my own practice. Apart from being uh, academic, I have been working as a business consultant, as a management consultant to some organizations, especially the industries here in the northern Italy and sometimes also outside this area, but mostly in northern Italy and mostly with the manufacturing industries, uh, heavy industries. So my my experience with these people whom who have to make somehow uh, continue the business, they cannot 
just become overnight environmental heroes, dropping all their current level of practices, current practices, but they can slowly, gradually make a transition towards uh, sustainability. And in that case, they ask my help, and I have been trying to help them uh, to improve their performance in, especially in uh, three, four areas. One is about the, the about uh, the environmental performance. The other is about their workforce and workplace uh, performance. And the other is about their social, their community performance. So now I'm going to share with some of this experience, personal experience, as well as some what I studied from other scholars and other cases, which I have not been directly involved, but I have had a chance to read them and to see them. Now, you see, everything here, the official level and the official institutional level and all businesses are somehow are aware of that, that the United Nations has made uh, the so-called 17 sustainable development goals. And uh, this is not the first time that the United Nations talk about or mention that or make it an official uh, motivation, official work, official uh, declaration announcement. They have done several times on other like Millennium Development Goals, like other goals and so on. And many of them are the United Nations tries its best, but many most of the time it is just a wish list. I call it wish list, a list of desire. Because the the, the, the practice there in practice, there is no legal enforcement. The, the, the these international charters and international wish list don't have implementation mechanism. Every country has its own rules, its own law, uh, laws, and even within a country, many times you have a different uh, situation, a different normative and institutional um, setup, even within a single country, like in the United States, like in India, like in the, all the federal countries, that have their own regional variation. So, and then also there's a sector-wise difference. The some sectors, it is much easier for them to make a transition to sustainability. For some other sectors, it is hard. Like those who work on the steel. I have been working with the steel industries of Italy, of the Northern Italy. Now, they, they, the, the whole process of making steel, um, the heavy industry is, is heavily impacting. But at the same time, we cannot do without steel. Even uh, a person with a kind of walk, person with a handicap, physical handicap, needs a wheelchair. The wheelchair has a steel. Your coffee machine has a steel. Anything that we construct, infrastructures, from the basic object of daily use to large scale infrastructures, the steel is everywhere. The steel is necessary. But at the same time, the process of making steel, a steel making process is heavily impacting. So how this is a dilemma. We need, but at the same time, this pollutes and this is heavy. It has a heavy toll on environment and society. So here again, so that's why I don't so much uh, become very interesting about this wish list. But it, they serve a purpose, at least they give a basic idea of where we should go to, what may be our direction. Now here, now this has been, uh, also there is a, you see, the, the, the United Nations has also a global compact. You might have heard about United Nations global compact. They have a, it's a, it's a like some basic rules that some business people have underwritten and they have expected, and then they have accepted, and they, it is expected that they apply that. And this is a synthesis, the Global Compact, United Nations uh, Business, Global Compact for Business, is somehow uh, a summary of these 17 goals. Now let's, but besides that, here again, sustainability has been, uh, like we more or less 10 years now, uh, that it has become very, very fashionable. And uh, why? 
and then how it became so fashionable, and then what is the real meaning of that term, and we should start with getting clear about the concept. So let's you let's see the term. I don't know how to say it in Russian, but in English, Italian sustainability, in English sustainability, in Spanish sustainability. Now these all these terms they have they have their common root are coming from the old Italian, uh, medieval Latin that became Ita old Italian sustinere, which come from. Uh, also in English, also in French, and then in English it went for, through the French. Now this means, this uh, at the origin is uh, two terms of Latin, two Latin terms. One is called sub, sub, below, tenere, to hold, so holding from below. So to, to something that is you, you, that one has to keep on holding from below, that, that means holding from below, but it means not letting it fall down. So it implies some deliberation, an intentional, a purposeful action. Nothing is naturally, automatically sustainable, except very, very huge mass of wilderness where there is no human interference, like the Amazon forest of once upon a time, or like the Siberian taiga, or like the Arctic or Antarctic. So these massive natural systems the which, where, which has not been overly interfered by the human activities, they may have their own mechanism to sustain. But anything else where the human intervention has already taken place, where the people have already interacted with, which is already disturbed, in that case, like in the most of the world, the, the, our anthroposphere, the human world, here we need to be careful. We need a measured and conscious effort in order to sustain a system, a system, a village, a town, a business organization, a government, any system, any system that has economic implication, any system that has that human organization has produced. So here, sustainability is about not really perfection. It is about the dynamic, a dynamic quest, a dynamic purposeful action how not to make it collapse, how to keep it in life, how to give it continuity. So it's a, it is actually a deliberate, purposeful action to prevent disruption or discontinuity. And this is what means, and in, in other words, we can say it's a controlled transition. It's a controlled transition in the, uh, 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 and planned and controlled transition to lead an economic organization towards lessening the burden and cost and to prevent the risk of disruption or discontinuity. Again, the, this, this became very, very, uh, this became very popular with the, in the beginning it was, it, it came the institutionally, officially, it was, made in 1987 when the United Nations sponsored a big commission of many experts, economists, biologists, environmental scientists, and the commission was headed by the former Prime Minister of Norway, Miss, uh, Mrs. Gro Harlem Brundtland, and because of that it was called Brundtland Commission, and the report after three and a half years that commission made a report, final report, and which was published as with a title called Our Common Future in 1987. And the main uh, recommendations of that report was at least as a political symbolic gesture, it was accepted and it was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations in its resolution number 42 of 1987. So it, it is if you and then here again, and then after that, the, they, they came in 1999, a little bit later, there was an international non-governmental organization that was a research organization that they created a sustainable reporting guidelines, how to report how to how to measure and report sustainability actions 
Uh, so this global reporting initiative is still today, most of the business organizations, uh, commercial and industrial organizations, as well as the government, they use some way, a variation of this global reporting initiative standard. And then there is, a, they have established the whole so-called triple A bottom line. The, the basic that we'll talk about that a little bit later in the next slide. And in 2001, the European Commission issued a, the so-called Green Paper in which it provided a charter for sustainable development, uh, emphasizing the need to, 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 to compromise between economic, environmental and social uh, needs. So this is, this became more, again, it became more and more official. So here, the triple bottom line, A bottom line is about environment that means natural resource and ecosystems must be safeguarded according to the the the, the triple a bottom line uh, guideline and the second is the productivity and the wealth must be created uh, economy economy is important it, the productivity and prosperity are important and third is the distribution of income and opportunity should be as fair as possible so it's some kind of social equity and justice. So this triple A bottom line is about environment, economy, and equity. That is equ fair distribution, equal opportunities, and good distribution of wealth and income in the population. So even if there is prosperity or environmental improvement, but then then it, it is not it is not advantageous to um, uh, the majority, only to a small minority. Then it has no meaning. This is the this is the whole thick point about that. So here. The official triple bottom line concept is about sustainability is that middle ground of compromise where economic and financial viability is maintained, where social security, social equity and human security is also maintained, and where environment and landscape quality are maintained. So, so and this is not so easy. I mean, it is a, it is a very the official model of 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 uh, what I say behavior or of policy, uh, but not many many governments pay only lip service to this. They say, yeah, yeah, we do this, but they never do it. Still, economy is more important than social or environmental considerations that we can see. Even in the European Union, European Union, European Commission pretends to be the most environment friendly most humanitarian superpower. It is not, it is not the truth. They are still behind the money. For them still money is the most important thing. And then it, 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 the one thing is that their policy papers and announcement and the other thing is the real life practice in policy and real laws and, and norms. So, you know, here again, this is the official, but it's the official concept. It is an official concept. But it's not always trusted into practice. Now let's go to the unofficial uh, concept. More than concept, let's say the perception, the real life perception of sustainability. When I I, I travel a lot now, I'm I'm blocked here because of this lockdown because of the pandemics. But usually every year I'm somewhere in the United States or in South America or in China or in Taiwan or in Nepal. I was supposed to be in Russia, so, and before I was in Africa several times. And you know, in every travel in the last 15, 20 years, I have been doing one thing. To everybody that I had a little bit more interaction, like a driver or a translator, or my colleagues, or my students, or the people or the restaurant where I often, where I was more of often going to eat, I always ask, you know, to those friendly people around whomever I met who are not necessarily intellectuals, I used to ask them, what do you, do you think about sustainability? What does, does it mean to you? And most of the people have no idea about sustainability. Sustainability is not a common word. It's not a common conscious concept anywhere. Even if it is so much used now in the official papers, in the documents, in, in the universities, in the government, but it is not yet a inner concept of common people. So then we have to think in a different way. How the people, the common people, the citizen, 
a common citizen, a common consumer perceives sustainability. What is that? So the word sustainability, they may not have a conscious idea, but the, the, the meaning is there. So what the people really want, and then I started I used to take note of everything that I used to hear during the daytime with the common people that I met in Africa, in Asia, in South America, North America, in Europe. Even in Russia, I was there uh, two years ago. I, I, I passed through Russia. So everywhere, I used to always ask to the people that I have some, some connection, not necessarily in Asia, and they, they would tell me, what is more important for you and who should do that and who should implement that? The most important that, that so it all came to basically the value, the value that is cherished by the common people, by the community. What are the values? So it's basically three. First, security. People want security. They want to be safe physically, financially. They, they want some kind of safeguarding against the unemployment, crisis, health problems, and law and order, crime, offense. So security is the basic, the first, first thing that people everywhere, everywhere, despite the cultural differences. This is the most transcultural concept that I have seen, that I have come across, security. Security in a, in a very wide sense. So now security is a value, and who the people think that should provide security? I think basically they, they expect that from the government, from the government, especially in case of law, order, trust, and uh, social security. Now they also expect partly from private providers, the, the, the system, the organization that run the utilities like electricity supply or gas or other things, so supply system providers, and then they expect also from employers in case of people who work in an organization or work for some, some organization or some company, they expect. So it is the in, in order. Security is the very important value. And it's a very wide concept. And the, the actors who are supposed to implement that value, to make the value lively in the society, they are in, in a gradually, the top is government, second is the suppliers, providers, and the third is employer. So people expect that from the sector. And the second very important point about the common people about the common citizen, consumer, little businessmen, small service providers, workers. There's community and there is fairness. Actually, I haven't seen anywhere in the world that people want equality in everything. People expect that we are all unequal, that equality is not always possible, that we are born unequal. We are born in different families. We are born in different condi physical conditions. We are born with different mental capacities. We are born in different countries. And then if that also happens, if you are born in Burundi, in a small village of Rwanda or Burundi, or if you are born in a European town, and that, that makes a difference. So there's no equality. But what the people expect is fairness. Fairness means distributive justice. Fairness means fair treatment, fair play, impartiality, no discrimination. So this fairness is very important. It's very ethical concept and it is always expected. It is the most cherished value after security. And that again, we know we have, we have seen the official concept is the economic equity environment. And now here again, the people's concept, security, fairness, and the third, and then again, sorry, let's continue with the fairness. The fairness, who this is an important value, but who is supposed to implement, make it turn into practice or translate that into action through laws, through enforcement? Who is supposed to implement that value? Again, the actor. And again here, the role of government is primary, the first. Everybody, even in the most capitalistic country, 
even in the country that has, that is very individualist, like the United States of America, or you know, even here, the state, the government, is supposed to be the main provider of fairness, the implementer of fairness, and then after the state, it is expected from business leadership. So the le the businessmen who shine by giving their example, by by becoming treating their workers in a right way giving authentic signals, rewarding the hard workers, rewarding the good people, and providing training and, uh, and promotion opportunities in a fair manner. So business leadership, it comes after the government. And then the third element is in cultural leadership. The stars, the celebrities, the actors, the artists, the musicians, those, those who are very famous, those who are who, whom you can create opinion, those who create trend, those who create fashion, and people follow them. And this cultural leadership, if there are coherent examples and authentic signals, which is very rare, though most of these celebrities, this so-called cultural leadership is so self-indulgent. They are so much busy with their own glory. They are not really care about being fair with the society, but it's still, but still, it is expected, and they can influence a lot. And then the citizen also. The common citizen helps they are kind to each other. How they are law-abiding, follow the rules of the society. So this is called civic solidarity. So it's the common people also who are supposed to be, to be providing or implementing the fairness. So and the third, this is completely forgotten by all economists. Economists never think about wellness. They think about security and maybe also fairness, but in other terms. In the economic, they are usually talking about equality, uh, distribution of income. And, uh, but the third and very important element, value, is wellness. Wellness means it's not richness exactly. Wellness is different. Wellness is is the is the, the the feeling of being worth and the joy of life. So here again, the environment, landscape, the beauty of the town, the cultural activities, entertainment, free time, even religious services. <clears throat> so there are so many items, so many dimensions in the society from where people receive wellness. So here, the sustainability, if we forget the official concept and term, but if we see from the real life of a businessman, of a worker, of a taxpayer, of a common person, a farmer, a, a trader, of a common people, they are looking for security, fairness, and wellness. And it is their language of sustainability. Actually, sustainability, when there is security, there's fairness and wellness, a system can continue. There will be no <coughs> breakdown in the system. And the system can, can, can lead to a future. So again, it is about disruption as a prevention of disruption. So in, in a business organization, applying the same thing, security means health and safety of the workers, workplace, of the uh, stakeholders. Fairness means a meritocratic distribution of salaries, training and promotion opportunities, a fair, a fair treatment, and wellness means some extra activities that a business does, a business organization provides. I have uh, some friends here. Now I, I'll tell you good two examples. I, will, I became a friend of this businessman. I helped them in that sustainability management. And one of them is a tele, <clears throat> technology business. And now his, his company is not in the town. He's a little bit outside, located a little bit outside the town. So the workers who come from the different towns, they come by car or by, bar, by, by, by public transport. And it takes them to some people, it takes 40, 45 minutes. Some people are near, some people are far. So they have to drive, come and travel. There is a travel time. So it is the travel time and average it is one hour. 
between going and coming from the workplace to home and home to workplace. Now, this time, they have to always rush because when they finish the work, they have to make shopping, buy something for the family and home. So now I provided an, a small advice to my friend, the businessman. You have 400 people working with you, for you. And this, this 400 people, means 400 hours every day is ever is lost. And then they have to add an extra half an hour or another hour to go to the shop without choosing too much, very quickly grabbing what they can and go rush back to home. Why don't you provide them the shopping opportunity inside the shop, at least for the basic needs like food? And then he agreed. So in his company, we opened a small corner where all organic, natural, and locally produced by the local farmers of the nearby area, food items, vegetables, fruits, wine, we provided them. So, so this became, so the, 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 the traders were very happy because they, had, they got a new outlet without paying any tax, without making a new shop, but they had a new outlet and the company would, would provide them. And the company was happy because the, the workers will not be wasting time Workers were very happy because they didn't waste time. And during the break, uh, during the coffee break or during the lunch break, they could make shopping and go straight home after the end of the work. This was a small example, but this made the, the business better. The people were happier and, their, and the uh, time, less time was lost. And the businessman, and uh, actually you can see that result in, is in this way. So wellness is very important. So his security, fairness, well, and this is just a small example. And now the, another, there was a commercial organization in Tuscany, not here in the, uh, in the central Italy. Uh, I was involved with them for three years as a consultant to help them manage this big commercial organization of the construction materials. And here again, they had a lot of space. I said, why don't you organize a space, a corner, a small room with some basic facilities and a place to where they can have some some cultural activities like they want to play some people who are playing could play guitar because some were had so we among the colleagues sometimes in the free time they had and we call them spazio necessario the, the necessary space we call it the necessary space and the, the businessman agreed with my idea and we applied that it became very successful the, 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 the worker loyalty, their happiness. Happy people produce better, work better. So wellness is very important. So in the sustainability of a business, well, so these are just two examples that I provided you. There can be also many others. So again, this concept is forgotten many times. So, you know, sustainability is all, they all talk about only environment. It's all about environment. No, it's not only all about environment. Environment is important, but it's not all about environment. It's about <clears throat> society. It's about people. It's about the moral acceptance of the people, happiness of the people. So, but sustainability be became came from more from the environmental uh, issues. So it is still dominated by the environmental question, which is important, of course. This I no doubt about that. And this became very important. Why? Because in the last 30, 40 years, they realize, we realize <clears throat> that the landscape the, 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 is fastly changing. Our world is getting in trouble. The planet is in trouble. It, is, it has fever. The warming is high. The planet has fever. It's like being sick. The planet is sick. So and the, this became an urgent issue, especially in the last, the studies were already going on since more than 20 years. You may know about the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change of the United Nations. They have been working on it since almost 30 years, I think, even more, I suppose, the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change is a, a small scientific office uh, run by the United Nations. And they were also given Nobel Prize, I suppose, some time ago. That organization was the one which received Nobel Prize for peace or something like that. Anyway, they 
haven't really produced any solution, but they have at least indicated the problem. The problem is in the climate, the, the looming disasters due to the past change in environment regarding the change of climate. And now climate change, again, is a, is, a, is a very, I don't like the word climate change. I prefer to call it climate uncertainty because climate always changes, you see. No year is the same as the previous year for snowfall, rainfall, temperature, or, or wind, or anything, or humidity. So climate is always changing. But the pattern of change, how it is drastic, it is very uneven, it is very repentine, and it is affecting a lot, and it is unpredictable, very wild, that is the problem. <coughs> Not change in itself. That's why I prefer to call climate uncertainty rather than climate change. Now, the climate uncertainty create environmental change. The environment changes. And that, that poses serious threat to ecosystems, landscapes, and the resource base, uh, the soil, the forest, the rivers, and it has an implication for the human security, for infrastructures, and in the long run also for the global order and peace. If there is a, a scarcity of water, and then the river that flows through many countries, and the countries will fight for the rivers, for the water to divert the river. And then if upstream a country makes a dam, or it diverts the water, and the downstream countries, which are another political system maybe, they become enemies. So at the end of the story, the global order and peace depends a lot also on environment. It's a, it's a strategic issue. It's a very strategic security issue, the climate uncertainty. Now, again, we have what we can see is that the reality experience the experience of the reality by all businesses and all people, community and business and government is that we have a frequency and intensity of rapid and discontinuous changes. The changes are rapid and unpredictably discontinued. There's no continuity. You can, it's not, there's not, not a single pattern or, or, or a predictability in the weather and climate. So what so far the climate science has produced? Nothing certain. The variables may be many. Let, let me just think about one thing. Let's think. What is the main influencing factor for global warming and Earth atmosphere? Sun. Sun. The so we are a part of the solar system. Sun is the most important element. The sunlight, sun heat, sun rays, they are very important. They make everything changes because of that. But can we study the sun? Have we studied the sun? Can we go near the sun and take a sample and study how it is changing, how it can influence? Can we do that? We can do that with the moon, maybe with the, with the Mars, but not with the sun. Sun is the ultimately unstudiable thing. Anything that goes very close gets barred. So if the most important source of influence on the earth cannot be studied, how can we make be certain about this is the cause of the climate change? So that's why for me, nothing is certain. So there may be many other things also, also like maybe things from the ocean, and may not, maybe also some kind of cosmic constellation change that is influencing the earth atmosphere. So only thinking about gas or petrol or emission or our, our, our industrial pollution and giving all blame to that. And I think it's too much for me. Certainly that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do nothing. If, it, if, if, if climate science has no, th no certainty to us, the climate uncertainty is a reality, environment change is a reality, and it affects us, it affects our life, it affects our business, our bread, then what are the options? What can we do? There are two, only two options. There are no many options, only two options. One option is how we can prepare a system, a company, a factory, transportation, buildings, 
health system, how we can create a system that make the human being less vulnerable. That we're ready, preparedness. The preparedness, how we don't transform our buildings, our uh, social infrastructures into a trap, into a mortal deadly trap, where in case of any problem, we're trapped there. I remember a, a case of Kobe in Japan in 1995 or 96, there was a big earthquake. And many people died not because they were crushed by the buildings. They were only wounded. But the, the ambulances and the rescuers couldn't reach them because the town was planned so on, it, it, was, it grew so much on, uh, spontaneously that the people were on the rubble under the rubble, and it was difficult. Any access to the rubbles in certain areas was impossible. So this is very important. So how we organize our land use, our infrastructures, our business systems, health and safety measures. So it is about becoming conscious about the human vulnerability, where the human being is vulnerable, where there are threat to human integrity, human security. So start eliminating the threat elements, even without thinking about what may come after. But just this is the, the first thing to be done. Now, this pandemics, now with this was not also, this is like a black swan. Nobody expected this. This, it started in China and the Chinese government did the cover up in the beginning. So the three, four very important weeks, the crucial weeks were lost. It, 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 the, the, the virus got the time to spread out. And then when it arrived here in Western Europe in the last 20, 30 years, 30 years especially, they have been always, every year, they have been cutting the budget for the health in the name of being competitive, in the name of being, in, the, in, in order to maintain the credibility and the value of Euro, and in the name of being competitive system. So the more and more money was, 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 was taken away from the health system and it was more given or put on the more productive system only. So and now when the, this crisis happened, there, there were no ventilators, there were not enough masks, there were not enough inter intensive care unit in the hospitals. And this very developed societies, they found themselves with a the naked bottom on the floor. This means they are vulnerable. So if you don't think about the human vulnerability as the prior task, apart from whatever have, may happen or not happen, it, this principle of precaution is the principle of precaution to contain the risk, contain the damage, and creating resilience in the system, the human system, organization, business, community. So this is what is the first option we have. The only thing, I hope that this pandemics will give us, teach some lesson to everybody. And now even in your, in, in your country, your government, when it realized the problem, they immediately started building a new big hospital near Moscow. I read that in the news. Well, this would have done it before. This would have had in place a good health system long before, but nobody thought about that. So again, what is, what is the priority? So they, this is the priority. So only two options we have in the in the climate uncertainty. The reduction of human vulnerability, the principle of precaution, and collective resilience, how the society can be resilient, how the business can be resilient. It's all about human vulnerability. And then whatever we do, let's choose for that should be fair, beautiful, and durable. Durability. When something is durable, it doesn't become worst very soon. Anything, anything, any object, any infrastructure, if you project it to be beautiful and durable, that means you are not creating too much of movement, too much of waste, too much of cycle, too much of material cycle, material flow, energy flow, energy cycle, which is, which create risk, and which also may be contribute in the climate uncertainty and the environmental change. So these are only two things. So we have only two possibilities. That is choosing for sustainability and reducing human vulnerability. 
the other options are not there. Now, look, let's, let's, why? Let's try to understand, apart from the question of climate answer, let's look, in 1961, you know, a long time back, many of you students were not born, I was already born, maybe even the professor was not yet born, I don't know. So a long time back, the earth resource, forest, soil, water, fish, fish stock in the oceans, fresh water availability in the world was more or less like that. So those red points were those where there was an extreme use, overuse, and other places where there was a fairly underuse. So only less than 50% of the biocapacity, Earth's biocapacity was consumed. So we were in surplus. The Earth was in surplus. If we <coughs> now look at the situation after in 2001, when many of you were already born, the thing became worse. The, if you compare these two pictures, now here, China, India, more of the east, north, west, the coastal areas, more in the Eastern Europe as well. Some part of the coastal and urban areas of Africa and the Middle East. So, and then again, if you go further, Today, now, it's worse. Now, these areas, you see, the, those areas which are red, which are very dark red, they are the, where the, the ecological footprint, the human impact on the natural resources and on the environment is very heavy. And then the green is the, the, the blue shades are those where it is lesser. So you can see, you can see, even in, you see, even your own country, Russia, how was it before? You had plenty of, how is, how it is now? How are just only, two thousand in the balance of, between up to 2005, let's say ecological creditors and debtor, those who took more from the nature and those who didn't take more from the nature, you could see. In the first the upper side, those who took a lot from the nature, those who impacted heavily, India, Europe, and those who impacted less than what they needed in 1961, you see, North America, Russia, a lot of uh, part of Africa, most of South America, and Australia. Now, in 2005, the situation has already changed. North America was worse. Mexico was even, Mexico is the dramatic case of pollution and environmental destruction. Dramatic. Because they found the oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And the oil industry destroyed a lot of things in that area. Because they did it without any precaution. They only thought about making money, money, money quickly. So, and you see even in Africa, many parts of Africa, and China, India. So this is, and now today we are in this situation. Now, our footprint is heavy. Also, Russia's footprint is very heavy. Europe's footprint is almost like Europe now. The, the way of consumption, the way of people's behavior with the nature, with the natural resources, dumping of the West. Everybody is creating more West with every personal life, personal consumption. So this, Australia has, have gotten very bad. North America, very, very bad. And this, this is how the situation today, only the most undeveloped areas are remaining somehow there. In, but it's not because they are good and they, they, they behave well. And so it's just simply because the, the massive poverty has makes them their access to uh, modern industrial products and their access to fuel is limited. Only that. Now, the, the main, co main cause is population growth, of course. People have become a lot. And the, the people, the, 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 the increase in the population, you know, people started counting more or less in the 16th century, they started counting how many people live in a country or so on. But then it became more and more accurate. Since the beginning of 2000, almost every 13, 14 years, 
we are adding 1 billion people more on the earth. And in the meantime, because the, you know, the whole world the, has been giving a lot of emphasis on the vaccination, reducing the child mortality in, in the third world, in Africa especially. So reducing the child mortality, vaccination, universal use of vaccinations against the disease, and to reduce the child mortality, United Nations work on that. Many international organizations work on that. So they are, they are saving many lives in the early childhood. So there's no more natural selection in the third world countries. So the population is growing like anything. And the growth of population means consumption of resources. Consumption of resources, in not only in one place, but also the spillover. And then the people move. The massive migration from Africa to Europe is because of this. And here you can see where they are growing more. As I told you, they are growing and where they are growing less. Now in Japan, they are decreasing. In Italy, they are decreasing. In Spain, they are decreasing. More or less even, in, but not increasing very much in, in many other countries. Increasing fast in those countries that have the least occupation, uh, employment, and development. And Muslim countries there, and in the African countries, is increasing. There are cultural reasons also, but there's basically economic reasons and also all the international drive to save the child mortality, to, to prevent the child mortality. Now, you see, you can see it by this chart where in Asia it is not increasing anymore, but there are already a lot. In the Eastern Hemisphere, people are already a lot. That's, that is less three fourths of the humanity is there. So, but they are not increasing anymore. The China and India, they have been successful in containing the growth rate of their population. China with force, India in a more democratic and liberal manner, but they have been quite good also for the majority, at least, at least for the Hindus. The Muslims don't obey them. They keep on keep on increasing their population. But the common Hindu and Buddhist people, they are they are family planning, birth control, they adopt those measures. So basically overall population of India is not increasing that fast. In China, they had a one child policy for 30, 40 years. They would punish you if you had more than one child. And they would not give you permission. It was more forceful, illiberal implementation of the child, of the family planning. And they were, anyhow, even though they, the measures were very uh, unliberal and un unhuman, but they got some success. Now, that is not the case with Africa. That's not the case with the Middle East. Even in Latin America and Caribbeans, the population is not increasing. The growth rate is slow. In, in Europe, it is decreasing. Actually, especially the Southern Europe, the Northern Europe, they have maintained somehow. So overall, the cumulative population of the earth, the complex population is increasing. Even though the growth rate has slowed, but the overall accumulated population is very high. And that is, that has an impact. Now, after the number of people, what makes the, the, the difference in the sustainability how a country has a more sustainable or non-sustainable system doesn't depend only on the number of people, but also on the density of population, where more people are crammed, where there are more people compared to the resources or the space. And in this case also, you can see that the density of population in those places where they have more environmental problems. And organization. And here again, in the <clears throat> last century, actually, in one century, the whole economic growth model, economic development model has been urban centered. It is the, the if you have to become developed, you have to go to the city. That's what every child of the farmer, every village man, every village boy or girl always believe that. And he still believe that. So everybody flocks to the city because city has the opportunities, training opportunity, job opportunity, income opportunity, 
and opportunities for dev personal self-realization and development. So this, even in, in a country like Mongolia, where I worked in the past, or Armenia, if you go to a small village, the, the, the school boy, he always dreaming about one day to become, to study well and to become successful and to pass and then to go to the big town, everywhere. So this organization means a new style of life. And that means a more consumption of the industrial product, packaging, more packaged product, means more waste, more use of the heating, more use of the transportation, more use of the fuel, <coughs> and less <coughs> local circular economy. And it's more global supply chain economy, not circular local economy. So that has an impact. And you can see that everywhere in the world, in the third world, first world, everywhere, in the developed countries, underdeveloped countries, in the in the eastern countries, western countries, European countries, everywhere, urbanization has been driving. So not only the number of the people, but also the density of population and the urban concentration. Now, currently, we have more than 50% of the humanity is living in the city. Now, the city means a consumption model, a lifestyle that has a heavy ecological footprint, has a more strong impact. <clears throat> After the number, density, and <clears throat> urbanization, and the concentration, the fourth element in the demography that makes a very big impact is the structure of population. How is the population structure? Now you can see within this slide, in the underdeveloped countries where you have life span is shorter, so you have more young people and less old people. And more you go to the developed countries, the pyramid of the population is different. You have more old people and less young people. And more and more people. Now in Italy, for example, in my country, we have more than 30% of the population is above 65. That's one third is above 65. And one fourth above 80. And now during this pandemics, 75, 80% of the people who died were above 80. Now this population structure means you have more care, there is more pension to be paid. There are more retirement benefit to be paid. That means you have more health care and social policy has more expenditure. So you know, it has an implication for the government and for the business. And it also means that the people who are, are of a certain age, they are, they, they, if they lose their job, it's very difficult for them to be recycled because they, they, they don't have the new skills that is needed. So the whole project of the development, the, the, the whole development model that we see is urban, urban centered, young oriented. You have to be smart. Everybody wants to be smart. The technology is smart. The road, the transportation, everything is very demanding. So the old people are more inhibited. The old people, and they are more their needs are more, their needs are more uncommon, but at the same time, they are more and more penalized. They are more and more isolated. This, this model doesn't work anymore, I suppose. I think this would be useful. The old people must be useful to the society. So there must be a way in our urban design, urban planning, infrastructure, transportation, work, job policy, training policy, and this all about this, we have to think how to accommodate this part of population that has experience, that has some more, uh, more wisdom maybe. Now, one of my businessmen, friend, the guy who was the one who made the vegetable corner, he is in the technology business. I We, we talk very often about many things. Now I'm not actively consultant to him. I used to be his consultant some time ago. And then we, but we are still very good friends. And then I, Ask him, what are you doing about these young people? And uh, what, what, 
do you think that the technology, digital technology, new thing only, the young people learn fast and they already know it from the childhood. Young, old people are a little bit obsolete. How can you use them, retrain them? Can you find a way? Look, what did, what did uh, Steve Jobs, why Steve Jobs became so famous, the man of the apple? Because he did a very important innovation. Before the whole thing of the digital technology was only by like a typewriter. It was a keyboard. So people were, were completely conditioned by a keyboard mentality. It was the keyboard. It, it was all about keyboard. So many old people who didn't use keyboard in the, in the, in, when they were young, they didn't have anything to do with the computer. But with a touch screen, he changed that. And that innovation brought a lot of old people to digital technology. The Apple iPad was a revolutionary product in its time. And now everybody using the, 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 this touch, touch screen technology has become very... Now again, with the maybe with this COVID pandemics, the, where you cannot touch every anything, maybe again we will go back to something or not touch, maybe only the voice or breathing or something, I don't know. You know, you see, t innovation is very unexpected. It comes from your creativity. Now, the, this is what we need now. In our economic model, in development model, in management model, business model, we need some very creative innovation. Because this is because the reality is very different now from the before. So here again, we already talked about that. We I just give you the three examples: one of the Europe, one of the United States, one of Congo. You can see the Congo, uh, the pyramid of uh, of of, uh, of population structure. That's why they migrate. The young people they have no job, no money, no hope. Go to Europe, pay to the the uh, human smugglers, human traffickers, find some way. And then, of course, there are some people who will help them because they want Europe to be all multicultural and all multi multicolored. And so they pay the non-governmental organizations, go by the ship to rescue them in the Mediterranean. So you see now, this, all this drama, and people take advantage of that drama for their own political ideological purpose. Many people are taking advantage of that, but the reality is a human drama, and the human drama is very important, not the ideological proposition and manipulation afterwards. The human drama is that we have a very imbalanced population structure in the world. Now, we, what we learn from the from the from the from the history that what really matters for sustainability. What, the, what really matter? What ultimately matters is the population growth, urbanization, business and management model, policy and management model, the government policy and the business management model that may, and human capital and science and technology. What new technology appears, how it can reduce the problems and innovation. So here again, <clears throat> these are the main thing and how they affect. So what are the constituent of our economic policy and business management? So, you know, we have to take into consideration these things, this element that I told you have to be measured with factors. Factors are the given conditions, how your habitat, what are the resources, the number of people now at the present you have, and the actors, the how are they vulnerable or, or resilient if they're entrepreneurship, people create their own job. They, they are wealth creating, value creating, or only passively waiting for a job to come to them or to be employed. And the values. What are the values about this world? How to behave, how to run, how a company, how to... And the values are very important. What are the guiding principles? And what are the transcendental values? What do you believe in? And then, so what are your purpose of life? And the institutions and policies. Here, these are these are the two things. This, this, this basic things affect those things, and that's what really matters for sustainability. Now, and the, as we see, how it, the factor to determine sustainability or unsustainability, the so human dynamics and natural ecosystems. 
So population, as we say, size, density, structure, concentration, and resource use purpose. Now, it's not only the number of people. Like India has a large population compared to the United States. United States, there are 330 million. In India, there are more than 1 billion. But uh, average Indian, he doesn't create so much West as an American does. And his impact on the nature, his impact on the, his use of fuel, his West per capita, per capita resource use, space use, items use, energy use is much lesser. So again, that makes the difference. It's not only a question of the population, it's also a question of the, the lifestyle, values and norms, and the kind of business and the regulation and compliance, consumption pattern. So these are very important. And here again, there's a serious need of good policies, good leadership, good example, good business management program. And then environmental impact per unit of resource use. I mean, for every dollar that you burn in petrol or gas, how much you are obtaining in terms of productive value? So for, if you have to, Create if you you uh, if per capita you are you you are creating let's say one kilo of waste the non biodegradable the, the the kind of waste that that cannot be digested by the earth not like the skin of banana or the potato that you can throw on the ground and it will be absorbed by the earth that that is not absorbed by the earth non biodegradable waste how much are we producing? Now, that's the environmental impact per resource. So if we produce one kilo of waste, but how much are we getting in terms of satisfaction, need satisfaction? So this is the balance. The, 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 the balance of resource use, and for, for every resource use, space, or energy, or material, or, or anything, how much is how, 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 what is the value that is being created? The value in terms of wealth, in terms of need satisfaction, in terms of quality of life. So the, is, it is again here, the role of policy, management, techno, management and technology is extremely important. So sorry, this slide is not well done. Um, uh, we, we have to, I'll correct and send you the better one. So policy, management and technology. These three things make the difference. Now, for example, a common factory of China. China produces is a big, huge industrial power. They produce everything now, not of a high quality, but many things. Everything, almost everything. But for for every dollar of production, their use of fuel, gas, fuel, petrol, or diesel is much higher, or carbon, than Europe. The Dutch or the Italian or the Japanese, they produce maybe for the same value, they are using less fuel, they are using less energy, they are using less material because they are wasting less. So it is the technology. So how sharp, how efficient is the technology? How good is the management? And what kind of policies you have? Policy, I, let me give you an example of policy. Now you see, in um, in, in, in 1990, the government of Sweden, the parliament of Sweden passed a law. They, they made a law by which they, that if the, any company that has, that produce something and sell, like you sell this, and it has a packaging, and that packaging becomes a waste. And that, at the end, society has to throw that somewhere, truck it away, ship it away in the truck. Somebody has to handle it, and somebody somewhere it has to be burned or dumped. Now that is a cost, that a present cost. So you have to calculate the cost of that right in the tax that you have to make the industry pay. And it's called the embedded waste. The waste is already embedded in your product. And even also the after use of every product, when the product is finished, is is, is broken, it becomes waste. So it is what you call the extended, extended producer liability. The responsibility of the producer for the end of life of the product. Now this was incorporated, so the tax system, 
was readjusted in order to offset that cost for the collectivity. Now the business management would see that, oh, it's a trouble if they can lobby the parliament. No, 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 don't put that tax, don't put the tax. They will lobby, of course, if they can. But if they cannot lobby, they have to adjust. They have to become more efficient. They have to think about how, how they organize. So that will, that will trigger innovation. That will force them to make more innovation. And that's what happened, actually, in the Western Europe. In the, in, in the, so there were some positive things that happened with this triggering of the innovation. So here, these are the things that make difference in the sustainability. Well, you know, there is a, a World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It has an office in the Geneva, Geneva in, in, in Switzerland. And they try to mobilize the global businesses, all companies and the suppliers and workers. This is about business. So they try to make somehow, it is the, it is the largest business uh, organization that is a non-governmental organization of business, a non-profit organization created by the business. And this is called World Business Council. You, may, you, may, you might go to their website. They have many interesting reports. Uh, they, you could get some, some of the ideas about what I'm talking about. And then there are many uh, innovation efforts are going on in management and so on. So you, I told you about the UN Global Compact for the United Nations Global. So the, some business camp people, they created uh, a, a principle based on the, the 17 goals that I talked to you about in the beginning of the United Nations. So they tried to concentrate on four, is, four issues, human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. And this is very interesting. So, and then according to that, they made the nine, 10 principles, 10 principles, I think 10 principles. So these 10 principles are about these four things. So this also, you may, you may go to their website, you can go global compact for sustainable businessmen. This is also interesting guideline for business practice. So global compact principles. Now here, this, I don't need to repeat you this. Now, let me go from my point of view, my, my observation. This is what I found from my observation. <clears throat> and, you know, maybe around more than 10 business organizations, mostly manufacturing industries, that I have been working and helping them to transition to sustainability or to make a little bit better their sustainability performance, whatever possible, in a more pragmatic and practical way. I'm very pragmatic, very practical person. And so what we see that in the, in the medium run, not even sh not in the short run, but in the medium and long run, there is a there is a good relationship between sustainability and the profit, profit margin, profit of a business. Business need to make profit. Profit is like oxygen. If there is no profit, if there is no oxygen, a body cannot survive. We need oxygen. Same business needs profit. Profit is the oxygen of business. But again, to have the profit, we need to have lungs healthy, to have the oxygen. But thinking only about oxygen, oh, I want more oxygen, more oxygen, more oxygen. So we develop always only the chest and the thorax and the chest, thorax, and then because we want more oxygen, that we become a monster. The hands, the legs, the head doesn't grow, but only the chest grows because we want more oxygen. The same thing about the business. If the business think only about profit, because they need profit and more profit and more profit, so they want only, they become a monster. They become a social monster. Like, the, they, like a human body that wants only oxygen and does a, 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 maybe a surgery to make a big chest in order to have oxy more oxygen, become a biological monster. So a business that only think about profit and makes everything possible only to increase the profit becomes a social monster, not sustainable. So here, but profit is necessary, like oxygen. We need profit. Profit is continuity. If there's no profit for a long period, then the business will collapse. It will close. People will be unemployed. There will be no value, no occupation, no employment. So profit is, is a must. 
but how this margin of profit increase with the sustainability practice? This is interesting. A, a corporation that goes towards more sustainability and concentrate on sustainability has a dual effect. On one side, it tries to create the product that is more sustainable. It's waste, it's impact, and the production process, this tries to streamline, to improve, more efficient, more energy efficient, more environmentally efficient, more health and safety. So, it, it, so the whole product and the process, process of production, producing. So this is what makes a company sustainable. And, and this will make the people who supply to that company or who sell the company's product, the retailers, the commercial agent, the middlemen, the middle agent agencies, the other businesses, the business to business, the other businesses related to that business, the stakeholders, the workers, the will work in the, they realize that my corporation or this corporation is trying to do this best to become more sustainable. So their loyalty, there's a more convergence. So they all give more. Also, they try to somehow it affect them. So even a worker that goes to the toilet of the of the company doesn't open the tap for a long time. It saves the water. And when it, it washes the hand, the, the, the towel, the paper towel, it doesn't throw uh, carelessly the, the towel. It becomes more careful in using the towel. They try to, so, you know, somehow a, a corporation that is sustainable and declares to be sustainable and practices sustainability every level of production process, it creates an impact and create a convergence in the stakeholders, workers, suppliers, middle agencies, other businesses related to your business, and this, this has an impact. And then you have a reduced cost of waste management. You create less waste. You have higher resource productivity per resource used, per matter used, per unit of energy used, you are obtaining more value. And then at the same time, because you are sustainable, you have less liability cost. The government will not punish you because you have polluted the river or you have dumped somewhere. They think you have less liability cost. There's no litigation. You have legal, less legal problems. Because you are already preventive. You are already working on being a sustainable. And then at the end of all, you have a lower cost. You are in the, in the medium long term, you're reducing the cost. In the beginning, maybe you have to invest on the making the production process a little bit better, being more careful about things. But in the in, in the medium long run, you are lowering the cost. The same thing with the convergence of the stakeholders. And with that, you enter in the preference, in the ethical preference. You see, ethic is very important. People think that you're good. <clears throat> so uh, you, you, suppose you are a, a, a company that makes the, the steel rings, a steel pipe, and I am the one who, who brings you, my, who trucks you the raw material. Now, what, when I see you, when I know you, that you are trying to do your best to be sustainable, it also affects me, but not only affect me in my work style, it also affect me th thinking, whoa, this is a good guy. So if the other guy, another industry offer me to supply them and they offer me better, a little bit better price or the same price, or even a little bit higher price, I said, no, this is a much better person. I prefer a long-term relationship with this guy. So you enter the ethical preference. So the entering the ethical preference means increasing the market share. When the workers, clients, stakeholders are imbued and involved in your sustainability and convinced of your sustainability, your market share increases because you enter the ethical preference. Ethical preference is very strong marketing strategy and communication strategy. And so at the end, you have economy of scale advantage also. Not only the advantage of reducing cost, but also you have the scale advantage. So your market share is increasing. You have more choice with the, with the stakeholders. You have better, you can employ better workers. Everybody wants to work in you. So you have more choice to get the best managers, best technicians, best workers. That's what happened 
with, uh, let me give you an example of that. Now, Toyota now is like that. Everybody wants to work for Toyota because they're good. They're really good. They do well. They do, they produce great products with a great, great sustainability care as much as they can. In the, in the beginning of the century, 100 years ago, Henry Ford, the America's uh, big industrial and inventor, what a nice guy, actually a little bit crazy guy, but interesting fellow, very interesting fellow. Now he, what he did, that time there was no sustainability, environmental awareness, environmental consciousness. They didn't talk about environment so much at that time. But he was very careful about the workers. There was no law in America, if there was no federal law of the minimum wage. How much should be paid a worker the minimum? He established for his company the minimum wage, which was twice the market wage, the common wage. And the second thing that he thought that he wanted to make a car that can the people, common people, workers, not only the big boss can also drive, can also have as their property. In, in those times, in the beginning of the, in the century, the motor car was only for the rich and the powerful, not for the common worker. Common worker were bus loaded, a train, bus, tram, or bicycle. They didn't have car like today. So he thought we, we make car for the people. So he made whole innovation, the so-called the, the so work chain, Ford, Ford chain of work. And then he, he made somehow logistic, logistic and management innovation to reduce the cost of production. So by in, in, in five, six years time, Henry Ford was able to reduce more than 50% the cost of an average car. And that's how he, he developed the first prototype called people's car, the T model, the famous T model. And from there, the Germans learned and made Volkswagen. They were inspired by the Ford people car. And then when Ford was giving higher salary than the average and giving producing car that common people with little bit of saving could afford. And at the same time, he would also uh, offer his workers a way of paying in, in, in small installations so that they can own the car wh when they want. So this, this combination, became he became into the ethical preference. Everybody, oh, it is for great. So the ethical preference created the brand. Ford became very famous. It was number one in, in once upon a time. And because of the ethical preference, not only about the, so here again, the management, innovation, logistic, careful and business practice was combined. And that with the, with the, with some moral values and guiding principles that created the ethical preference. So at the, at the end of this, uh, uh, the, the story, you have higher revenues, you have increased value of the company, and you have better market share. And this is what happens with many, many companies. Many good Italian companies are like that. And, and there are good examples around the world. There are not many, 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 but there are. So this is how it works. This is what I found out about the relation between profit margin and sustainability. Can we do a break, a little break? Yes, of course, Professor. Thank you very much for your information. Uh, now we will have a little break for you, about three or five minutes, and after that, yeah. uh, the last uh, part is a question and answer, yes? Okay. Okay, five minutes break, and after that, yeah. uh, questions. Thank you, Professor. All right. Okay, uh, dear guest, as I said previously, uh, you may uh, uh, ask the question uh, uh, with the... Um, Speaking with Professor, or you may write your question in our chat. Okay, we have a five minutes break, and after that, Professor will try to answer your question.
Okay, Professor, are you ready for the question? Yeah. Yes, yes, let's go. Let's go. Okay, uh, at the beginning, maybe somebody wants to ask a question orally because I have uh, two questions in our chat. But at the beginning, maybe some, some somebody wants to ask you in orally in the by the our yeah video yeah but maybe we should first finish the the thing and then maybe all the questions at the end. What do you say? Okay. Um, uh, now we will wait uh, the questions from the from our people. Yeah, but let, let, let me first finish the slides that we have. I don't know where are the slides now. They were somewhere. I don't know. Slide. You can I don't find the slide anymore. It disappeared. Okay. Can you see the slides now? No. We were here, right? I don't see your slides, unfortunately. I don't know how it happened here. Let me check again. Don't see the slide? No. No. Yeah? Not now. Let's start again. Let's start again. Everything. I don't know. Slide is okay. Okay, Professor, maybe some words for conclusions uh, without slides because uh, our people, uh, I will send your presentation to our students. Maybe some words about uh, the conclusions of your reactions and after that the questions. Okay, let, let me let me conclude then. Okay. PowerPoint, what is the PowerPoint? It's coming slowly. Taking time. Okay, it's working now, it seems. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I suppose. Sort of Yeah, it's working. The first yeah. Slide. Okay, we were here. We discussed a lot of things, and then we were here. Yeah, we were here. 
Okay, now the, the next is, and then we quickly, you see, we talked about the role of profit margin and sustainable corporation. Now, let, let me take you to another idea. What about this creating value and profit with sustainability? We saw the relationship. When a company is sustainable, it has in the medium long term a better profit margin. We saw that mechanism and we have seen that also in practice. Now, about certain companies, you can see that the way how we measure that a company, a business organization is more sustainable and less sustainable. It, to, to be sustainable, it must make continuity, business continuity. That means profit. But at the same time, it should also be careful about social environmental uh, factors. So here, at a certain point, a business starts with input, that is the material needed, energy needed, and, the, and then this input become output in terms of product and waste, both product and also some is, uh, waste is also created. Now, all that cycle of product and waste use of energy and emission, we may call it the total volume of material and energy flow. The flow of the use and, 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 and flow, the flow of energy and matter. Now this in a company, a business organization has to start, they, it makes profit for that much of energy flow creates that much of profit. So the value and the volume. So a company's volume, material flow, energy flow that create volume that increase with the company's growth, company's development. Now, and the volume and the value also create. Now when a company is continuously increase the volume, but the value does not increase or it has to create more volume in order to have more value, then that means it is not going to an unsustainable path. While if it is making on the, the, volume, the volume, the total material flow, the volume is constant or decreasing, but the value in terms of net profit and brand value, brand equity, uh, it is increasing, that means that's this what you call the volume value decoupling. This is the most important indicator for any business management to see and to check the sustainability. And also this is the main guideline should be for an industry, for any business organization to make, to, to turn the company into more sustainable and profitable company. So this is what you call eco-efficiency. Eco-efficiency is the volume value decoupling. Let me give you an example. A, a, a example from Italy. Now in Italy, you have, we have two important car manufacturers. One is called Fiat. It was very big once upon a time, and it's, now it is still big because they have also merged with the Chrysler. It's now called Flight Fiat Chrysler. Uh, automobiles and uh, once upon a time they also made some car they, they collaborated with the Russian company in the Soviet times and they they were producing with the Russians in the production of Zhiguli I, I suppose somewhere in the Tolia Tigrad they were doing that so now this company the Fiat in order to have the profit margin they have to always increase the volume if they don't produce more car and sell more car, if they're not able to sell more and more and more, they cannot survive. Because they must always increase. The growth for them is important. They must grow. The volume must grow in order to maintain the value. And now take another example. It's called Ferrari. You might have heard. They make a racing car, but also some luxury car. And they don't make so much cars. They make they produce very limited. Their production is limited, but their value is always higher. 
So they don't need to increase the volume in order to create the value. They maintain, they increase the value meant with a constant volume or even decreasing the volume. So this is what makes the, the, the two, two companies producing automobiles, you can see the difference. So this is what is the, the need of the time. That the, the, the especially in the manufacturing industry, but on any business organization, it can be applied. Your total material flow, even in a service industry, even in a tourism industry, your total material and energy flow should be constantly contained while you are increasing the value. So this is the relationship between productivity. So your your productivity must not be measured by the growth of volume, but only by the growth of value with the decrease in volume or with the maintenance of the volume. So this gap, this is called decoupling, this decoupling of volume and value is what should be the guideline of sustainability for business organization. Uh, now, you see sustainability and, and, and so the management the, the, those who run the business, they uh, they must be have a commitment. Their commitment should be to whom you respond, for whom you are com committed. You are committed to the market. You must sell. You must offer what is needed, and you must make money for that from that. And your commitment should be to the workforce and workplace, to the community where you are located, and to the environment in general. So this commitment. Management should start with this commitment and the focus should be stakeholder because a company is not an island uh, alone, a, a fortress or an island. It is actually a constellation. There are suppliers, there are retailers, there are workers and there are, there's a, you are a part of a network and that network is what you call a stakeholder and your focus should be the whole network, the whole supply chain. Uh, this is a, a, another the, for the for the management. And then improvement is should be a cultural process. There's no end to improvement. You know, this is what uh, the f famous Mr. Toyoda, the founder of the Toyota Motor Company, Senior Toyoda, Mr. Toyoda. Mr. Toyoda always said one thing. Look, there is no protocol of a standard because every protocol becomes obsolete after some time. You must think about what can be better than that. So this is called this what they call in management in the Japanese term for that is Kaizen. This means a contemplation of a new horizon of improvement. It's like a Buddhist meditation in which you watch what you have done, how, how, what best you have done, but don't stop there because it can be, you can still do better. So this is a cultural process. So in inside a company, this continuous improvement is a cultural process and this is this is for managers, those who run the company. Commitment, network focus, cultural process, business culture inside the company culture should be a continuous improvement and teamwork. It is always together. You, If you want to go fast, go alone, but you will not go a long distance. If you want to go a long distance, go together. You may go f slow, but you go long way. This is what Ubuntu, a very old uh, uh, African proverb, and this is called, if you want to go f fast, you, you, you will go alone, but you won't go far away. If you want to go far, you may, go, you may have to slow down, but you must go together. So this is a teamwork is very important. So again, he, and another thing is that it's not only abiding the law about environment, about pollution, about emission, about worker um, welfare, or about the pay. It's not only law abiding. It's not just only compliance, but it is also doing the right thing. It is foresight, anticipating. And it's always, you must always be better than the law. A, a, a company that works even beyond better than the law and they, it, it does even more than what is ex it needed, minimum needed, is what you call the anticipating, the foresight. And this foresight and ethics, morality, that your, your fairness, your fair treatment are very much needed in management. And this makes the company sustainable. 
It's at the end of the story is always the good people make good business. And and again here another model that I created very recently, and this is especially this, this came to my mind after some of my friends who called me. We are all locked down here. Now they are slowly relaxing, but many of the companies had problem with the supply chain because those who had to bring some piece or some part or some component. And some component was done in China. Many of the components were done in China. And then because of the lockdown and of the problem with China, with this pandemic, many companies have, were in trouble. And many are in trouble. Still they are in trouble. So this gave a lesson that you have to shorten the supply chain. You have to shorten the time. You have to shorten everything. You have to move. It, there must be a stride to zero. If you want really a company to be sustainable, there must be a pragmatic, gradual, and constrained drive to zero. You should as, use as less possible as material and energy, raw material. You should create as less possible waste as possible. You should do the thing just in time, like in the total quality management of the Toyota company. Just, just in time, so there is no big stockpiling, there's no big magazines and a storehouse and warehouse. You should be, you should make a thing very smooth and get the things done in the in the right right season in the right timing. So you should reduce the timing. The you also reduce the cost with that, especially in the this in in case of food is even more important in the food and drink item, but also in manufacturing is important. And then the space and distance. You should shorten the distance. So you should try to get the material and the and the uh, supplies as close to the site of production and consumption. So this is a strive to zero. It's, I mean, you, you may not realize completely, but the continuous strive towards zero is met what makes a lot of innovation and improvement. This is a, a completely something that came to my mind recently, and I would like to see this experimented in some small scale somewhere. We'll see, and I'll let you know if something some industry listen me about this. So, ultimate sustainability drive, strive. You know, again, uh, ultimately, in a business management, a business people is the is the, they have these three levels of sustainability, striving to sustainability, is striving and trying for sustainability. The first is the bottom line, the lower access of sustainability. That means you comply with the existing norms. You try to behave as per the rules provided by the government, by the uh, parliament, by the uh, institutions, by the local institutions, by the national institutions. So you comply. So compliance is the bottom line. Less than that, you are a criminal. But then this is not enough. You must have some more because a company is a social unit. It has a social responsibility. So you must take care a little bit of what you can of your uh, surrounding. You sponsor something, you help some kind of some schools, voluntary organizations, you help in the things. So it's what you call the corporate social responsibility is a proactive. <clears throat> it's not just compliance, it's more proactive. But this again, not very higher level still. It is a good level. Then the ultimate level, the highest level, is you provide example of correct of the your know, sustainability stride by making. As we cited many examples, I talked about Toyota, about Ford, about Ferrari, about the company that I work with. That they so again the company that created the small corner of the vegetable and food and wine for their customers. My friend who did that. And the, the other guy of the Tuscany, whom I, whom I was helping in transition, created this necessary space, a space for recreation for the workers. Now, this is, they become examples for the others. So some people are imitating them, try to do like them. So this is what you call the cultural leadership of business. The law doesn't ask you to do that. It's not asked by, by anybody, anybody, but you do it. And in that way, you create more consensus. You enter the ethical preference, and you become a, a. This is what you call the cultural leadership. So you have three levels of all striving to sustainability: complying with the norms, being more socially responsible, and also setting examples and innovating your way of being 
a business corporation, a business organization, and showing your cultural leadership. So this is what we call uh, ultimate strategy. So here, this uh, <clears throat> conclusion. So, for any business enterprise to be sustainable, it must have four things. It must balance four things. It, it must be economically, economically, financially viable. Income, profitability means business continuity. The second, human security and social wellness. This is very important. Health and safety, after proper remuneration, community welfare. So you do a little bit for take care of the people who work with you and take care of the people who are around you. And then third is the quality and quantity and quality of environmental resource and landscape around in surrounding. So how much you try to improve the environment and beautify the landscape of your surrounding, of your place, of your company itself, of your business area itself, and then also with among the stakeholders. And the third is moral legitimacy. So your fair play, your cultural leadership, will be given you, be, you, give you a moral advantage. So you are legitimized. So these are the four basic points, concerns that a business must have in order to be sustainable. It is very material. It is very financial. It is very social and human, and it's also environmental, but more, above all, it's very ethical. It's very important. So this is what is our model. This is the model was what we created a long time ago when I established the first center of sustainable economy in Italy. It was the first one. Nobody did that before. In, it will be 1997, a group of my students who were recently graduating, graduated, and some of my friends, they inspired me, they helped me, and we established a new center. It was a, before a formal group. For three years, it continued as an informal group. And then the university authorities, they made it a formal group. And so it's since 2000 till 2017. For 17 years, I run a very special research center, very applied research center, where we developed this model. This is not only my work, it's the work of my team, my former students, my former collaborators. Now I am not no more involved with the center. The center is, doesn't exist because the university decided otherwise. They dissolved it. They made a business school of a completely different kind. But anyway, but this model remained. We created some kind of, and in that period, we collaborated with a lot of companies and also with the government. And our collaboration, our practical experience with the clients, with the industrial clients, with the governments gave, that gave us an insight and we created this model. This is the ultimate integral concept of sustainability, which is, very different from the triple A bottom line concept that we saw that is officially running in the United Nations and the European Union and so on. I thank you very much for your kind attention. You are all very kind. You see, this picture shows a lotus flower in a very muddy water. You know, the world may not be perfect. The world is always like a muddy water. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of chaos. So don't expect the world to be perfect. Like the lotus flower grows, even in the surrounding, it is all mud, but it grows so beautiful and spotless in the middle of the mud. Same thing about a business leader, a, a corporate leader, a company, or even a person. You must be like a lotus flower. Even in the middle of the mud, you grow spotless and give the example of beauty. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, dear Professor Deepak. Uh, Pavel Vladimirovich now has uh, a very important call, so uh, I will help you with uh, some questions from our audience. And uh, first of all, um, thank you very much for uh, your very interesting and very intensive lecture. Uh, I think uh, that uh, all of our colleagues and all of our students, uh, I interested in uh, sustainable development and now um, even if they don't know something about this or even if they are not doing their research in this uh, uh, sphere, I think uh, they will be 
much more interested in this. So thank you very much. And um, we are waiting for your new uh, interesting uh, lectures and uh, information. And now uh, we will have in our chat five uh, questions. Uh, first of all, from uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Kristina Vladimirovna Drokina. Where uh, is she? Uh, she is yeah. here. Uh, show, but show, she, show, 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 but, us, show us. She's but, online? Uh, yes, but she wrote. It's a written, uh, it's, it's it's a written, written question. It's a written question. I will, okay, uh, okay, okay. I will read it. Uh, dear Professor, uh, one of the goals of the sustainable development strategy is to obtain a quality education. In your opinion, does the distance learning reduce the quality of education? Excuse me, can you repeat the question again? The quality of it, yeah. Uh, one of the goals of the sustainable development strategy is to obtain the quality uh, education. In your obtain, does the distance learning reduce the quality of education? Distant learning is not completely feasible. Distant learning is useful as a follow-up in case of this kind of interruption when you cannot uh, connect. But the, the ultimately, you need a direct human face-to-face -face teaching. Nothing can substitute a face-to-face -face human under interaction. But distant learning is a complementary, complementary thing. It helps. It helps in the in, 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 in case of interruption. It helps in follow up. It helps. So you should combine in the quality education. We must combine all available instruments, including the digital instruments. But only by digital, you don't become innovative. And there's no guarantee of quality. OK, thank you very much. And the second question from Kristina Vladimirovna. Uh, you talked about the importance of reducing costs. How popular is lean manufacturing method in Italy? It is. It is pre it's pretty popular. It's almost very widely practiced now, lean manufacturing. And uh, this is very, very much popular. And, well, it is, it, is part, it is a way of somehow the lean manufacturing is in line with the sustainability drive because it reduced the, the 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 total energy and material flow okay thank you very much and uh, next question from um Jorge parmenas some countries like germany are in the process of replacing nuclear energy with green energy on the other hand, uh, people like Bill Gates are investing more in nuclear research. In your opinion, is nuclear energy sustainable? In my opinion, nuclear energy is not sustainable. Because it is, if it, is, it were sustainable, there would be a lot of, lot of more investment in that. Mostly, most investment in the nuclear energy is coming from the states, from the government. Maybe in research, some people are participating, some private companies, the private organizations. But ultimately, in any country, you can see that most of the nuclear energy are in the investment. Early, in, the initial investment is always by big, big investment by the state. Now, said that, nuclear energy is not sustainable for only for one purpose. First purpose is, and the the first and the only reason is the nuclear energy is not costly when it is alive. It is extremely costly when it's dead. The funeral of a nuclear energy infrastructure is extremely expensive. The nuclear uh, spent fuel, you have to dump somewhere. And that dumping site, you have to seal off. That becomes off limit for, for any living creature. And in case of any kind of Natural disaster like what happened in Fukushima in Japan in, in, during the tsunami of, of Fukushima. You might have heard about Fukushima. Then you don't see your all your safety measures don't work in in many. So nuclear energy in the long term it has shown that it is not really profitable. It is not really sustainable. And those countries which insist on keeping on nuclear energy are going a wrong way for me. 
from my point of view. Uh, said that having said, because nuclear energy at the end you have to there is always a nuclear waste from the spent fuel from the the, the obsolete infrastructures from the, the 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 this site of industrial accident like in chernobyl or the site of the of the natural disaster like fukushima and the, there was also many others long island in america many many cases Small, big, small, big, many cases. Maybe big like Chernobyl or Fukushima, not so many, but many small cases, even in France, <clears throat> which has 60% of the electricity energy is coming. Now, in the long run, the collectivity must pay a lot and it's more dangerous than anything, any other thing. So if I would be a policymaker, I wouldn't invest on in nuclear energy. But also the so-called green energy, it's not all green. Now the solar panels are, they also have a lifespan. And the silicon, they are made by the silicon and some very syn synthetic and, and materials. When they become waste, they become hazardous waste. They are not easy to dismantle. They are not easy biodegradable. So again there, you have to point on the more durable, long life materials, but still it is safer than nuclear. And, and it is safer than the carbon-based fuel, the solar. Again, if the solar, you create a big grid of the solar, you need an in, incredible investment and an incredible space, and that's not feasible. You cannot cover the earth with the solar panels. So solar panel must be, there. a lot of invest, innovation is still needed in the solar energy. I still believe that it is one of the best, one of the best available, but not enough as it is now. It must, there must be a lot of technological innovation in there in the way that we must go towards, drive towards the standoff, standalone and off-grid system. No grid system, but self-production. Every unit, every building, every school, every, every single structure should use not the virgin space, not the natural space, but it's already constructed space to put the solar panel. So the, the, the virgin earth is not used for the solar grid, for the solar panels, the first thing. And the second that it must be a self-production, regulated self-production according to one's own need. There's no need of creating a large scale grid production. So it must be standalone off grid in that case and better durable material of the batteries, accumulators, panels, cables. So if we can move to off grid, standalone and and more durability and less toxicity of the of the material used for the infrastructures then perhaps solar is the best the wind turbine i'm not very much in favor the wind are dangerous the wind turbines the first of all they create they need a lot of space they destroy the landscape they make it ugly the the, the sea sea or or, or the crest of the hills or anywhere where you put wind turbines, they are they are completely they alter the landscape. They are, they make the landscape uh, fasting. So I already don't like them aesthetically. But besides that, they need a lot of material, cement construction, and that should be transported. That should be maintained, kept in life, and and repaired. So at the end, to make the solar turbine go on, you need a lot of carbon to use that. When a lot of trucks and bulldozers and machines should come and go there. Besides that, there is a very wrong, a very dangerous aspect of wind turbines. Apart from the ugliness of the landscape and a lot of carbon used to, to create and to maintain and repair, there's another very big problem. That they, and would not get enough studied, they, they kill the birds, they kill the insects, they destroy the the natural path of the ins insects, <coughs> of the butterflies, of small insects, they are important for the ecosystem. They create a continuous vibr vibration that disturbs the radar systems of a lot of insects, butterflies, bees, birds, and other, even in the sea, most probably, the, 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 you have, they have, they have, they have, noticed, they have not yet done a good research, but they have noticed that 
where there are a lot of offshore wind turbine lined up in the sea, that the wells coming to the wells dying and coming to the shore, the, the landing of the wells has increased. Maybe there's some connection, maybe there is not, but we don't know. Not enough research has been done because nobody is investing on those research. They have more interest in keeping the wind turbines because there's business there. So here again, I'm personally speaking, I'm not in favor of nuclear, but what already exists as nuclear, they should run till the end of their life as well as, as better as can and, and closed up and not create new. I agree with that philosophy, not just stop nuclear energy right now, as the Italy did. Italian government, the Italian parliament decided in 1986, I suppose, after the Chernobyl accident, they were all very frightened here. And then there was a parliament or referendum, and they just said no nuclear energy. But it has no sense. They, they don't nuclear, but they are not energy sufficient. They are buying energy from France and Switzerland, where they are making energy with the nuclear. So we are in Italy, they are not nuclear reactors, energy infrastructures of nuclear, but they are buying from other countries which have the infrastructure. So this is a completely absurd thing. So I think closing completely right now, stopping all nuclear stations are not a good idea, not sustainable, but not creating new and letting them live fully, use them fully, and then close them off safely. is the And that's what the German and the Spanish have decided. Good choice, good, 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 good policy. Now, about the other energy, about solar, I already told you, more innovation is needed, but it is still the best available. The, the, the wind, not good. The hydroelectric, very good. If the hydroelectric, but they, again, the volume of water and the flow of water is not constant. And so it is not completely reliable, but still uh, in the small scale, not a big scale, not big dams, big hydro dams, they, they create too much disturbance. But small scale, many little mini grids of the hydroelectric with the streams is maybe a good option, maybe a very good idea. And apart from the, this, uh, so the solar and small scale hydroelectric mini grid, in solar, innovation needed for off, off grid, standalone and durable material. And in the, in, the, in the hydroelectric energy, small scale mini grid community control. And more and not big things, not big things. This is what is sustainable. And then besides that, the best option is what? Is reducing the need of energy. The, the cleanest and the greenest energy, unit of energy, is the energy that you don't produce and you don't consume. The best energy is that not never consumed. The cleanest is. So how you need, reduce the need? How you can reduce the continuous the need of energy? not producing more energy with you know, a, a, a reno, a renewable or green, more, but reducing the need. So like, for example, now in, in many, many new buildings in Italy, they are, they are very good in making houses here. They are making so good that in the winter, the temperature is maintained very well. So the construction material and the good kind of wall making, roof making is reducing the need of energy to heat. That's an, an example. Now, if you have in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a city, you have more bike lanes, like in the Holland, Netherlands, and walk lanes. So then small needs of the people of three, four, five kilometers is more healthy. People walk, people bike to go to the post office, to go to work. In, in Netherlands, even the top managers, even the ministers go by bike to their office and work. Not by big car with many guards. and with, They don't do that. They are reducing the need of the energy. So if the, reducing the need of the energy is also how you manage your infrastructures, your urban planning, your transportation planning. So it, is, it should be more and more emphasis on need reduction, demand reduction, not in increasing and expanding new forms of renewable or non-renewable. Is that need reduction innovation. I can give you another example of need reduction. Uh, now the the tr uh, trains, many trains in Taiwan, in, in Taiwan, I saw it. I worked in Taiwan for some time. I established a center there in one university, a sustainability center in Nanhua University. I was the co-founder. Now, he, there I realized that the, all the local trains 
have a kind of seating arrangement in a such a way so that the people can take their bike inside. So many people take a ride by the train for a distance, and then for another distance, the local distance, they are doing by bike. Now, that little innovation in the local train, passenger train, make the big difference. It reduced the need of car. It reduced the need of more trains. So need demand reduction strategy is very important. And they are not paying enough attention to this. They are not enough attention to this. And the, another point again, apart from this, the need, demand reduction, and uh, uh, the other thing is that human factor engineering. Our human, normal human movement, human power, we use. We use our hand, we use our leg, we move. Now, many of the, like many people use the cyclet to exercise or tapis roulant at the home to make the exercise. Now, can't these machines become also at the same time energy generators for the home appliance, for the fridge, for the washing machine, for the dishwasher? They are trying that. This is interesting. So you are doing exercise, physical exercise, but you're also producing energy. That little that you need to, for your iron, for your electric dishwasher, for your, uh, for your washing machine. So you have to think about that. This is innovation, human power innovation. Now, one discotheca, discotheque, you know, discotheque where people go to dance. One discotheque of Berlin, some years ago, they tried one thing, and very successful. They, the, they were renovating the, the, the discotheque. They made the floor with a lot of sensors under the floor. So many people every evening, there are 40, 50, 60 people coming and moving and dancing around. So they are paying to dance and drink and dance. Now by dancing, they, by their movement, they are producing the energy. So that discotheque was using more than 40% of the need for the electricity and heating from the energy produced by the people's dance. Interesting. So why not in this direction we go? Why not in the demand reduction, human power solution? If this would be a gradual, start from the demand reduction, then to the human power solution, then to the solar, then to the hydroelectric mini grid, then maybe a little bit of wind. So we should, it's not know this, know that. It's not that. It's being pragmatic. It's starting giving more emphasis. Like bicycle is a human power. By human power, you move 20 kilometers. I use a lot of bike. My daughter always moves in bike. Many of my colleagues in, 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 the, in the Netherlands, managers, company, uh, ma big managers, university professors, they're all going on bike. They're innately not yet so good, but they are now thinking about it more. In Germany, is, they have followed the Dutch model. Dutch were the first. Now, if you look at the Copenhagen, the Denmark's capital, it is interesting. For every kilometer of asphalt, they have double double of the bike lane or walk lane. There is, there is, you have to create walkability. You must be walkable, bikeable. The demand reduction and human power use, they go together. So this is the innovation of our sustainability. Is it clear now? Uh, I think yes, and uh, I think that um, we can do uh, one of uh, our, your lectures about um, alternative uh, electricity. <laughs> and Why not? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> we can organize a seminar on that, maybe yeah. in the future. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, we have uh, also two uh, questions. Uh, yeah. First of all, first of this uh, from uh, our student Sis Daria. Um, why then you were talking about uh, values? You put uh, fairness higher than wellness. Uh, I I didn't put it, but what I found by interviewing many people, it was a very random research. Actually, you know, it was not a very systematic research. The questions were systematic. It was about sustainability, but the the sample were random. Random. It was sometimes a driver, sometimes a postman, sometimes a, a transport worker, sometimes it was a restaurant waiter or a restaurant manager. So it is a, sometimes it was male, sometimes female, sometimes a passenger that I was traveling with in a train in another country. Sometimes my own translator. When Mongolia was working, I needed a lot of translators. And so it, is, it was a very random sampling. But I collected their response. 
every evening I wrote my diary and I realized what comes first in the people's mind, fairness. They want to be treated fairly. Security, fairness and wellness. So it's not my priority, it's what I found by a random sampling and interviews. But again, I tell you this, since the sampling is very random and the number of people interviewed may not be many than some hundred, few hundreds. So I can't say that this is the whole picture of the whole world is like that. But it's interesting to notice it's a very small sample, very randomly sampled, but still it is indicative. And that's what I presented you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, also one more question from Valeria Falaleva. Uh, dear professor, uh, what is the best educational system from the sustainable development? I don't know. Among the existing systems, well, they are doing some very good work in Iceland, maybe. Well, the, com the still current education system depends on school level or university level, what level, or all level, what, what, what level of education system? Uh, I think maybe um, university, higher educational system. I don't know. I have no... I, I, I think, you know, I don't know which university system or which higher education system uh, is the best. I have no idea. I can't say anything. I think that Italian is one of the worst that I can say. I have experienced uh, Chinese, uh, Taiwanese, Indian, American, Swedish, Brazilian. I think the Italian is not one of the good. Uh, the South Americans are not. I, they don't. I am not convinced. Maybe some are excellent, some are not. But generally, I I, I didn't find them very, very good quality. United States also very mixed picture. You have quality and you have low quality. It's not very even picture. You have some top and very good. I don't know. As a whole, as a as, as a whole, higher education system. I am very unable to give you an answer. The picture the the picture is very confused and mixed up. Mixed. I can tell you that the Italian system is no good, from my point of view. Education, higher education system. And uh, in this case, uh, what should be uh, in educational system uh, in uh, educational system in higher level uh, to be good system from your side, from your uh, point? Of view? I don't know. I think the I don't know. Well, what I can see by the defect of the Italian education system, which where you have in Italy, you have very good, very good people also, very good centers of excellence. There are some universities where some centers are really excellent. So it's, but it's all about the, that specific team or that specific leading example of person. It depends a lot on the person and team. But as a whole, the system, Italian hydrogen system is not a good system. But Italy, you have very nice centers and excellent points in this country. This is very surprising. Despite the badness of the system, despite the lousiness of the system, very bureaucratic, very bureaucratic. A lot of bureaucracy here. But still you have excellence. So what I can say, I think for a university to be successful, uh, to, be, to be of a good quality, I believe there are three, four things in basic important. The first thing is that in the entry level, when the students come to learn, you have a faculty of law, you have a faculty of engineering, you have a faculty of sociology, you have a faculty of literature, uh, Russian literature, you have a faculty of English literature, with different subjects. People come from, from different backgrounds to study different subjects. To all of them, at least one or two months, you must give special common propedeutic teaching to create an overall cultural standard of the people. This is, I think, one very important point. They have done not done that. We should do that somewhere. So this is creating a propedeutic, a common propedeutic in every entry, every matriculation. Every time there is an enrollment, all the enrolled people must undergo a kind of small training, but very intense with some basic materials that create their cultural level because they come from different background to study different things. So we must create a cultural, high cultural standard. 
So they expect from the university standard this the teachers and the teachers also have the students who are already aware of many things. So I can identify seven, eight materials that should be taught in that. Well, this is a tool, maybe a very long detail. Maybe we should do a seminar of this with the university staff, with the university authority maybe. and staff. Maybe, maybe one day. But this is one thing I, I believe. And the second thing that I believe is that university, every department of university must start a, a public outreach program. Outreach program may be commercial, maybe non-commercial. Maybe the commercial, like for example, you have a department of management. Then the companies in your area, in your district, in your town, they should be invited time to time to participate about what you as an academic think about management practice and what they can share with you about their real life management practice. This kind of outreach, uh, if there is a people of the literature, if there are people of the Russian literature, then who are the poet, the literary circles, poem circle, drama school, a drama center, or the translator agency. So th those who deal with that kind of matter, you invite them make a seminar with it. So there must be a constant contact with the real world experience. I call it outreach program. Limited, limited, but must be in every department because there's nothing is useless in, in the society. There is a, like for example, you are an English literature, then you have make the journalist, invite the journalist who would make the foreign correspondence or who make the, so you know, everything. This is the second thing I see is very important to improve the, the the level of higher education and nobody does that you see i i'm i'm, I'm a lonely prophet in, in about this nobody apply my ideas only some business people apply my ideas and they have good results universities never listen to me never listen to me universities i'm so sad about that i'm getting old and nobody listen to me you know i used to i say this since the last 20 years i'm telling this to everybody because my, my experience and the third thing uh, after the cultural standard making, outreach program, limited continuous outreach program. And the third thing, very important, is that when, especially in the master level, or even in the undergraduate level, up, not in PhD level, not in PhD. PhD should be pure scientific research. But the master and undergraduate, when they have to write any paper at the end of their education, when they have to write a paper, like a, a thesis or a small dissertation or a small, that, that, that final paper, short or big, whatever it may be, the final paper, you should give a choice to the student to do either A or B, A, choice A, an academic paper, choice B, a business plan, a project paper. What would you do with your education? Make a business plan. Maybe interesting ideas come up. Like somebody is learning uh, drama, uh, history of drama, cinema, theater, etc. Then he may have an idea one day to open a drama company or a theater company or become a, 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 a producer or a director of a film. Now, his dream, his idea, let him put it instead of only an academic paper, give him the chance, equal. You want to make an academic paper or you want to make a project paper? Project paper can be a business plan, can be a project idea, and they, they make the survey, they see the market, feasibility, the demand, the supply, the competition, so they, they test the real real field of the, for, their, for their work. So this should be done, I think. This is the third advice that I have. Nobody does that. Again, I tell you, I am a very lonely prophet. Nobody listen to me. And the fourth thing after that, fourth thing I think this is very important to increase, the level of education, uh, of higher education level, is that we must create a business incubator inside the university. A university must have a hangar where people with the, those people who write project paper, the best one, the most feasible one, the most fact, practicable one, select them and for two years protect them, give them an office inside the university, they become the offspring, the offshoot of the university and then become when they are they start earning money then they go out and make a company 
and before they are, they are enough strong, they are like the small plant, you have to protect them like the small plant. So you, you give them a business incubator. So every university must have a business incubator. That's the fourth thing. Now, these are the four basic things, I believe. And that business incubator is not only about management or engineering, anything. And literature. Somebody wants to open a, a dance school. Somebody wants to uh, make a newspaper, online newspaper, whatever. All projects should be welcomed. The best ones, those who write the paper, then you have a, you, you select them, the best one, you as a reward, you get them for two, two years as a reward, as the best thesis or the best project paper, you give them a reward to create a, 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 a shelter. Or they have a secretarial service, they have phone, they don't have to pay for the electricity, for the heating, for the office rent. So then you give them a space, a business space for, for some time, for two years, three years maximum, not more than three years. Then they should be independent and then they go. They will, and some of them will be very successful and they will come back to give the university donations, help, provide internship. This is what you should create this, this beautiful cycle of, of collaboration. I think these four or five things are very important. Is it okay? Uh, yes, in this case, I can say that um, previous year, we had a, in Southern Central University the experience about uh, protection final thesis in uh, master level, uh, like a business plan. So That's we have this. Yeah, we have this, and uh, maybe in this year yeah. also some students um, uh, will do the uh, final thesis, uh, uh, not like academic paper, but also like a um, business plan and something like this. So very, very interesting. Okay, um, maybe someone uh, have uh, their own uh, questions. Uh, no, because in our chats, uh, chat all of the um, the questions is over. We also have uh, we also have um, uh, from uh, our colleagues uh, who asked the, the question best wishes to you and uh, that uh, it's very informative election and very detailed and an informative election. So uh, all of our students and colleagues uh, uh, say good words to you about your elections. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, I have a question. I have a question to you. Yeah. To, to me. You, to you, to you, both of you. I have okay. a question. Now, your students, are they very efficient, proficient in English? Yes, I suppose, yes. They, 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 they manage well English? No, not all, but uh, the students uh, that are listening to your lectures, it's about uh, maybe 40% of all of the students. Uh, I suppose uh, they uh, know English well. 40% of the old students, I suppose. Yeah. Well, English is very important. It is, it is, it is, it is a language of connection with other people, you know. I mean, this is a language that helps us to connect between people from different places. I think we should give a lot of, I should encourage our students to to learn and use better English and practice more English, also the staff, everybody. But it, it, learning English doesn't mean being, being pro-American or pro-British. I mean, it doesn't, has no meaning for that. It, it is it is completely a neutral thing. Language is, is a vehicle and English is a very, very easy, simple language. You know, when I learned English, I was very child. And so English is very like me for me a second language. But when I learned Italian and Spanish, that was long later, much later, it was so difficult. I mean, it's the, the European languages, apart from English, are much more difficult than English. English grammar is very simple, actually. It's one of the most simple. I think Russian is very difficult, I'm sure. Yeah. It's difficult yeah. than English. But I would learn Russian anyway. We have, because uh, at first we have uh, 33 letters in our alphabet. Uh, in English, only 26. <laughs> yes. Is, and the sounds in Russian language is more uh, complexibility than in English, I suppose. Maybe not so complexible as in French, uh, but uh, more, more complexibility than in English. Okay, okay. Professor. 
Uh, professor, uh, I suppose um, uh, we will have uh, one more your reaction in this semester. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The end of May or in the beginning of June, we will agree. To yeah, yeah. This any any time, any time is okay. Any time yeah. by the end of and May or the beginning of June, every any Wednesday is fine for me. Yeah, we will we will announce your future election. Thank you for today's material. Thank you for your uh, nice. Uh, view of uh, sustainable management. It was very interesting for me personally, for uh, our students and for me, my colleagues, I suppose also. And thank you for your cooperation with our university because uh, we are really appreciate this in this uh, such strong period. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.